Amen. I want to read from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Thessalonians, and kind of in keeping with some of the things that we've been doing for the last few months, we've been doing a lot of just the basics, the fundamentals, the things that we cannot afford to forget, the things that we need to be reminded of as often as we can. And this is another in that series of thought. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16 the Bible says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. I want to talk to you here for the next few moments simply about the peace of God. The peace of God. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your anointing. Ask you for these next few moments that you'll give me your words to speak to your people. God, let this be a living word that would take root in our minds and in our spirits and produce life, produce peace, produce hope, produce joy in the days and weeks to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I think I almost every Wednesday now I threaten or say that we're going to be doing a verse by verse, walk through some of the scriptures in the Bible, some of the books in the Bible, and we will be doing that. It's just a fascinating when you really get into the study of the Bible, but we're looking at second, a verse here in 2 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians I find to be an interesting book. It is uh, obviously the second letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, there was some time that passed between the two letters. I know in our Bible, they are back to back, and they might seem like a continuation of the same letter, but, but there is a space of time between the book of 1 Thessalonians and the 2 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians is a relatively short letter. It's just three chapters, the entirety of the letter that he wrote in 2 Thessalonians, and historians believe that Paul wrote this letter, sent this letter from Corinth when he was on his second uh, missionary journey uh, at around 50 or 51 A.D., and it's kind of strange to think about dates like that, the year 50 or the year 51, but it's believed that this is when Paul wrote this, and he wrote this second letter to the church uh, and the, the, the people in Thessalonica. He wrote this second letter to expand on some of the things and clarify some of the things that he wrote in the first letter, but he also wrote this letter to address some of the things that had transpired in the space, the time after he wrote that first letter to the people there in the church. And we find that after the first letter, some things began to happen. First, uh, after Paul wrote that first letter, it was it's believed that a second letter, a false letter was circulated. And people were claiming that this additional letter was another letter from Paul. And this letter created issues among some of the other claims that this letter made. It was, it's believed that uh, somebody wrote this letter pretending to be Paul, and one of the claims that they made was that the second coming had already taken place, and people in the church in Thessalonica were a bit confused about this letter. So Paul wrote the, the second letter uh, just to address some of those things, and he also uh, let them know in this second letter that before that second coming would happen, that there would be a great falling away from the church. There was a warning here. He not only has the second coming not happened, but Paul let them know in the second letter that before the second coming takes place, that there will be a great falling away. Also, since that first letter uh, to the church in Thessalonica, we find that they had gone through a time of persecution, and Paul addressed the persecution in the second letter. So Paul wrote this epistle in part to clear up some of the misunderstandings that were taking place and also to strengthen the faith of the church there in Thessalonica. And so this third chapter where our verse comes from, our confidence in their ability to do everything that God 
had instructed them to do. And then uh, he warned them to separate themselves from people who had uh, come in who were disorderly and people who were walking in ways that were contrary to the things that the church had been taught. And he encouraged them to ignore those uh, who were looking to lead them astray. And he encouraged them to follow the example that he had left for them and to not be distracted and not be confused by all uh, of the other voices. It's in this passage that he admonishes the church in Thessalonica not to be weary in well-doing. It's amazing how it, with the, all the many things that have changed since that time and all the many things that have changed with the people of God since that time in 50 AD, it's amazing that although so many things have changed, so many things remain the same, that there is still in 2024 a need to pray for each other. And there is still in 2024 a need to encourage each other. And there is still in 2024 a need to separate ourselves from people who might be disorderly and people who might be walking in ways that are contrary to what we know to be true. And we still in 2024 need to be careful that we follow godly examples. And there is still in this day and time a call not to be weary in well-doing. It is in this context that we find our scripture text this evening. At, it's at the very end of this final letter to the church of, in Thessalonica that we find our text here that we read today. He's closing out this letter by saying uh, in verse 16, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. He calls God the Lord of peace. And then he prays that this Lord of peace would give his people peace always and in every way. What a powerful prayer that is and what a powerful desire that is. Peace always and in every way. Is there anybody here tonight who uh, can acknowledge that you would like to have uh, peace in there? Anybody who's walking through uh, some situations here tonight who, who are not too proud to say, yes, God, uh, I would love to have peace always and to have peace in every way. Uh, can I let you know here tonight that that kind of peace uh, does not come from this world. Uh, that kind of peace uh, does not come from your situations uh, and your circumstances. Uh, that kind of peace uh, does not come from the happenings uh, in your life. Uh, there is only one uh, who can give you peace always uh, and in every way. Uh, but I believe there is somebody here tonight uh, who can afford to say, uh, I need the peace of God always. And I need the peace of God uh, in every way. Uh, and I need it here tonight. Mm. The Bible cautions us that we are to be wary of the wiles of the enemy. That means that we are to be alert. We are to be cognizant. We are not to be ignorant of what the enemy is trying to do. That we are to be watchful of the devices of the enemy. We need to know what the enemy is trying to do. And hear me when I tell you that one thing that the enemy is doing in this day and time is attacking that very real peace that God desires us to have. He's attacking the peace that the Holy Ghost was meant to bring into our lives. And the peace that God intends us to have is missing from too many of our lives. But it's my prayer that here on a Wednesday night uh, that somebody's understanding uh, will be open and that somebody will leave this house with the peace of God uh, resting and reigning and ruling uh, in your life. I don't believe I have to do much to convince you that we're living in a day and time where the minds of the people of God are under attack. I say it all the time, but I'll say it again. You, you have to always consider how many of the signs of the end time are mental in nature. The Bible doesn't just talk about wars, but 
The Bible talks about rumors of war. That's a mental attack. The Bible talks about deception in the last days and false teachings in the last days and offenses and hate and fear and love of waxing cold. The Bible talks about stress in the last days. There is a very definite attack on the minds of the people of God in the last days. The Bible lets us know that we have an enemy, that we are in a battle. And I remind you here today that this battle is in the mind and this battle is for the mind, that this battle takes place in the mind. And what you're fighting for is the very control of your mind. And the enemy would like nothing more than for your mind to become yet another victim of the circumstances and the situations in your life. The enemy understands that it's human nature to allow what's happening on the outside uh, to find its way on the inside, to allow the disturbance on the outside uh, to find its way uh, on the inside. Uh, but I remind somebody here tonight uh, that what's happening on the inside uh, is out of the reach of the enemy. He has uh, no control uh, over what you feel. He has no control uh, over how you think. He has no control uh, over what's happening on the inside uh, of you, but he recognizes uh, I might not be able to change how they think uh, but perhaps if I surround them uh, with troubling things uh, they will go behind the hedge and they will tear down what I cannot tear down uh, he understands uh, I can't change what's happening uh, in their heart uh, but perhaps they'll find themselves uh, in situation uh, after situation uh, and they'll destroy uh, what I can't destroy uh, but I've come to preach a defiance uh, into somebody's spirit uh, where somebody recognizes uh, that the peace of God uh, enables me to go through life uh, and make sure that what happens uh, on the outside uh, does not dictate uh, what happens uh, on the inside. Uh, my God. Uh, it's my desire that somebody will leave this house feeling a bit like Job. The enemy recognized that Job was behind a hedge and he recognized that there were limitations as uh, to what he could uh, and could not touch. But the enemy was convinced that uh, if he touched everything around Job, if he touched Job's situations and Job's circumstances and Job's finances and Job's health and uh, if he touched his children and if he touched everything around Job, uh, that then Job would destroy the things uh, behind the hedge uh, that the enemy could not destroy. But Job had something on the inside uh, that enabled him to say, uh, though he slay me, uh, yet will I trust him. Uh, I might not understand why I'm going through the things uh, that I'm going through, uh, but there's something on the inside uh, that's out of reach of the enemy. Uh, I might lose everything around me, but that does not change uh, who I am. Uh, and that brings us to this principle of peace. I've said it here before, but I'll say it again. That peace is not an emotion. That peace is not a feeling. Peace is not a thought. Peace is not an idea. But peace is a state of being. Peace is a condition. And by definition, peace is simply freedom from disturbance and strife. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a real condition whereby there is freedom from disturbance and strife. Most of the time when I talk about what peace is, I, I've used in the past living in Houston as we did for many years there with the hurricanes. I know that up here in Canada, you guys don't know much about this, but hurricanes come in hurricane season and there's wind and there's rain and 80, 90, 100 mile an hour winds and just trees being uprooted and homes being blown down and all kinds of things that are happening. But it's always almost surreal, the difference when there's the rain is flowing like that and the wind is howling like that. When you walk through your front door and 
you close that door behind you, there's almost a supernatural difference between the chaos on the outside and the stillness on the inside. I tell somebody here today that that is what peace is. It is uh, the ability to say in this house and in this temple that there is uh, the ability to have a lack of disturbance. It is uh, the ability to say that you can't quite tell what's happening in my mind and in my spirit by looking at my situations and looking at my circumstances. But God has given me the ability to have a lack of disturbance uh, in the middle of disturbance that God uh, has given me the ability uh, to have peace uh, in the midst of uh, a storm you've got to remind yourself often that peace is a fruit of the spirit that it is something that comes from what's on the in something that comes from what's on the inside and not because of what's happening on the outside that's why we can talk about peace in the midst of the storm because what's happening on the outside does not dictate what's happening on the inside. And that's why Philippians 4, 7 can call it the peace of God that passes all understanding. That means uh, it's a peace that defies logic. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. It's a peace that exists when uh, everything and everybody else says that there is no reason for peace to exist. And uh, it goes on to say in Philippians 4 that it's that kind of peace that will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Hear me this evening when I say the enemy knows the importance of peace and that's why he attacks and shakes and does everything in his power to destroy your peace. I don't have time to get into all the verses, but Isaiah 48, 22, the Bible says that there is no peace for the wicked, but that the righteous were never meant to try to live without peace. The Bible says in Isaiah 32 that the church and the, the work of righteousness would be peace and the effect of righteousness would be quietness and assurance forever and that my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. God desired and God designed that his people would live in and with peace. I tell you here today that the peace of God will manifest itself in multiple ways. First, it will manifest itself internally. Within yourself, you will have internal peace. But it will also manifest itself in your interactions with other people. That you can have peace with those around you and you can promote and encourage peace in those around you. Finally, the peace of God will manifest itself in your relationship with God. The best news about peace with God is that that peace is an eternal peace. That if you can maintain your peace with God until the end, that that peace will become an eternal peace. So for just a few moments Allow me to talk about those three levels of peace. Internal peace, external peace, and eternal peace. We talk about internal peace. There is no substitute for internal peace. That lack of disturbance that we just talked about on the inside. That ability that when people look at your situation, and they say that you should be just about on the verge of throwing in your towel. You have a lack of disturbance on the inside. I was reading about a king who commissioned for the artists and the painters in his land to paint a picture that would illustrate their concept of peace and being the king and being uh, his word was law and his word was supreme and everybody desired to please the king. They say artists and painters came from all over the land and they submitted many different 
drawings and pictures that the king, he somewhat appreciated, but the king narrowed it down to two pictures. One picture, they say, was a painting of a lake, and it was calm, and the water was crystal clear, and there were mountains in the background, and there were blue skies, and there were clouds, and everything about this painting was beautiful, and everybody thought, surely this is the painting that the king is going to choose. Surely there is no other painting that can capture what peace is as dramatically and as accurately as this serene and pristine picture. But as the story goes, there was a second picture that that king liked even more. They said in this picture, you could also see a mountain in the background. But this mountain was not a beautiful, pleasant-looking mountain. It was a rough and rugged-looking mountain. It was a sharp mountain. And overhead, there were not clear blue skies and beautiful clouds. But they say that... The clouds were stormy and uh, the sky was roaring with, you could almost hear the thunder and you could see the lightning bolts. And uh, there off of the mountain was a waterfall that was crashing and you could see the mist. And it was a picture that seemed to en encompass everything but peace. But they said if you look really closely behind that waterfall and the tiny crack in the rocks that there was a nest. And in that nest, there was a bird peacefully tending to her chicks in the midst of the storm, in the midst of all of the threatening things that were happening around it. And as the story goes, this was the picture that the king chose because he said that peace does not mean that you're in a place where there is no noise. Peace does not mean that you're in a place where there is no trouble. That peace does not mean that you're in a place where there are blue skies and still waters, but peace means to be in the midst of all of those things and still be calm in your heart. He said that this is the real meaning of peace, to be able to be surrounded by chaos and darkness and uh, unfavorable situations, but somehow still have a, a stillness. Can I preach uh, to somebody here today that the peace of God uh, is the ability to be surrounded uh, by chaos on the outside, uh, but have a blessed assurance uh, on the inside that the peace of God is the ability uh, to be surrounded by questions uh, on the outside, uh, but have a blessed assurance uh, on the inside. Uh, the peace of God is the ability to uh, to be able to say, I don't know how everything uh, is going to work out, but I do know that it will work out. Uh, the ability to say, uh, I don't know what tomorrow holds, uh, but I know who holds tomorrow. Uh, I know that he's in control. Uh, and so I can sit right here uh, in the middle of that circumstance uh, and still have the assurance uh, that all is well uh, in my life. Uh, uh. I feel the Holy Ghost here today. Uh, the peace of God is internal. A lack of disturbance on the inside. Uh, we can't control what's happening around us. There will always be things in life that are beyond our control. But we can walk through life with the peace of the Holy Ghost. We can walk through life with the lack of disturbance on the inside. Secondly, the peace of God will manifest in our relationships with others. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And theologians describe that word. They say that that word paints a picture as kind of the webbing together of God and humanity and all of God's creation, that that word speaks to a webbing together. It speaks to things being in a right place and in a right order. It speaks 
to things being the way they ought to be. It speaks to things being the way that God meant for them to be, that it points back to a time perhaps uh, like it was in the garden before sin came and before sin destroyed peace, uh, a time where everything and everybody uh, were able to live together and work together uh, in harmony and community. That That is what peace really, really means. Uh, ability to be right in our relationship with God and a right with our relationship with each other. It's the peace of God enables us to re restore relationships that sin destroys. In Hebrews 12, 14, we are instructed to follow peace with all men, with everybody. We're instructed to follow peace with all men no matter what they look like, no matter what they sound like, no matter what we agree on, what we disagree on, no matter uh, wh whether we like them or dislike them, we as people of God are instructed to follow peace with everybody. And I ask you here today, if we are to follow peace with all men, how much more should we follow peace with those who are of the household of faith? People of God are meant to be a peaceful people, a people who look to make peace and look to maintain peace and look to create peace. We are to follow peace with all men. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, that we reflect the character of God. We reflect the image of God. We look like God. We sound like God when we are peacemakers. We all know pot stirrers and we all know instigators. We all know people who all you have to do is go online and watch a video of two people who look like they might be somewhat interested in fighting. And they'll be surrounded by a bunch of people who are not looking to be peacemakers. They're looking to be instigators. Take two people who are considering fighting and make sure they can't back out of the fight. They back them into a corner. We're surrounded by people who bring disruptive energy into many situations. But hear me when I say those people are not reflecting the character and the nature of God. They're reflecting the character and the nature of the enemy. We are to be people who do the opposite. When I think about peacemakers. I think about the war in Liberia. And I've told us some stories here. We'll just piece by piece. I'll just little by little get more and more of the story out. But you've heard me talk about a bit being caught in the Civil War in Liberia and how it just disrupted the whole country and and you know we were trapped there multiple times multiple situations and for about 15 years that country was torn and uh, estimates say that between one-fourth and one-third of the population of the country was killed during this time terrible terrible things that happened but many of the people who survived that battle survived those years only survived because there were peacekeepers who came from other West African countries. The surrounding countries with the financial assistance of the UN, they came in and they became peacekeepers in that situation. Some people were fighting because of tribal hatred and some were fighting there in the Civil War. Some were fighting, and to be honest, some were justified in the anger that they had. And some were fighting because of atrocities and things that were committed because of tribal differences, and some, quite frankly, were opportunistic. They were fighting because they could loot and they could get things for themselves, but the peacekeepers were there fighting for an entirely different reason. They were just as willing to fight as the other factions, but they were not fighting for any selfish reason. They were fighting for the cause of peace. Some of them gave their lives 
They died for the cause of peace. That may be the most selfless reason to fight. People fight for money all the time. That's easy. People fight for power all the time. That's easy. People fight for control all the time. Anybody can do that. But it takes a special person to be willing to fight for peace. Peacekeepers, peacemakers. There's a higher calling in those people. Finally, let me discuss eternal peace. Peace with God. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. The Bible says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. The writer here is referencing how God has brought both the Jew and the Gentile together. Despite circumstances, despite history, despite divisions, God has brought them together, made peace possible among themselves, but also he made peace possible with, the, with himself. God being our peace made peace possible for those who were once at enmity, made peace possible amongst the people but also made peace possible with himself. Romans 5.1 puts it perhaps even more clearly. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Tell you here as I get ready to close that the peace of God is not something that we can produce. It's not something that we can manifest. It's not something that comes from situations. It's not something that comes from circumstances. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but if you're waiting for the time to come where your peace comes from the things that are happening in your life, you're going to be disappointed. If you're waiting for the time to come where you're going to be able to get peace from anything in this world, anything, anybody else in this world, you're going to be disappointed. The peace of God only comes from the God of peace. The peace that I'm talking about only comes from the God of peace. But this peace of God covers everything. It is all encompassing. And if you will allow it, it will manifest itself in every part of your life. This peace of God, it brings internal peace, peace within yourself, a lack of disturbance no matter what you're walking through. It brings external peace, the ability to live with peace and to create peace, to be a peacemaker in our jobs, in our homes, in our church. It brings internal peace. It brings external peace, but most importantly, it brings eternal peace, peace with God. Sometimes you've got to know how to look at situations and say, it might not be well in every area of my life, but as long as I can say it is well with my soul, as long as I know that I have eternal peace, 
That's something that I can hold on to. I am at peace with God. There is no disturbance in my relationship with God. There are no obstacles and no blockages in my relationship with God. God, if I can have internal peace, external peace, and eternal peace, I can walk through any situation. I can be the man that you call me to be. Can we stand all over this building? I don't know every situation that everybody is walking through. I know some of the storms that some of us are facing. But I deliver here a simple message, a simple reminder that the God of peace is with you in every circumstance. And like it was with the disciples on the ship in the storm, and they had done everything in their power to save their ship, and nothing was working. And finally, they woke Jesus up, and he spoke peace to an impossible situation. And all of a sudden, the winds and the seas obeyed. That God of peace is here on a Wednesday night. That God of peace is able to speak into your situation. And you can walk out of this house full of internal peace, external peace, and eternal peace. And my God, that's all that matters. My situations don't have to resolve themselves before I can have the peace of God. I don't have to know how everything is going to work out before I can have the peace of God. But I can have peace in the midst of the storm. I can have peace that passes all understanding. I can have peace that I can't even explain to So I can't even put it in. You won't understand it if I tried to explain the peace that I have. I believe the God of peace in these next few moments, wants to do a work of peace in this house. Why don't you just lift your voices and lift your hands and speak right now to that God of peace. Uh, let peace, uh, let there be a peace that moves into this room. Come on, a lack of disturbance, a lack of disturbance. God, a lack of disturbance. Let there be a, a blessed assurance that sweeps through this room. God, I, I know that you're in control. I, I know that you're able to work every situation out. I know that you can be trusted with my life. You can be trusted with my circumstance. You can be trusted with my health. God, I, I believe in you. I trust in you. I count on you, God. You are my peace. God, you are my peace. You are my peace. You are my peace. I don't have to have the answers, God. You are my peace. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. My God, always in every way. Peace always and peace in every way. Peace when I come in and peace when I go out. Peace when I wake up and peace when I go lay down at night. Uh, let the God of peace give you peace always in every way, in every circumstance. God, a lack of disturbance, a lack of disturbance, a lack of disturbance. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Let there be a lack of disturbance on the inside. Let there be a lack of shaking on the inside. Let there be a firm foundation in my life. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Let there be peace. Hmm. Somebody ought to speak peace into your situation. Somebody ought to speak peace. Peace be still. Peace be still. Somebody ought to let the Prince of Peace speak into your situation. Peace be still. I know it seems impossible, but peace be still. I know the rain is falling and the winds are howling, but peace be still. I know that there are distractions and concerning situations, but peace be still. I know you don't have all the answers. I know you don't have it figured out, but peace be still. Peace be still. 
peace be still. The God of peace be with you. Why don't you make up your mind you wake up tomorrow speaking peace, standing on the word of God. If you're Holy Ghost filled, remind yourself that peace is a fruit of the Spirit. That if you have the Holy Ghost, you're equipped to have a lack of disturbance. If you have the Holy Ghost, you're equipped to live and walk in peace. Wake up tomorrow speaking peace. Wake up tomorrow claiming peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Like what I feel here tonight. Let's go in victory. Let's go in peace. Let's encourage each other. As we leave, let's encourage each other. Let's speak peace. Let's make a commitment to be a peacemaker in a world of instigators, in a world of pot stirrers, in a world where people want to fight and people relish in that. Let's be a church full of peacemakers. You shall be called the sons of God. Amen. God bless you. Let's go in peace. Let's shake hands. Shake hands, hug necks, love each other. Let's be the church. Remember.